Hi, I'm Tristan Kimpel, and on this edition of Turbo Talks, we're going to talk about the do's and don'ts in turbocharging. So let's talk a little bit about the do's and don'ts to turbocharging uh, your vehicle. Uh, more specifically, the do's and don'ts for your turbocharger. So uh, one of the probably biggest things um, that we see is oil coking, which of course also causes oil contamination. And of course, this is uh, majority of the time from hot shutdowns. So this is uh, when you're out spiritedly driving your car and you pull into your favorite store and you just shut the key off. Uh, what you've done is you've heated up this center section to a very high temperature and you've just cut off the cooling medium. So there's nothing passing through it pulling the heat out of the center section, the bearings, the shaft. The oil that is left in there is then of course so hot that it starts to actually cook. When that oil starts to bake it becomes a hard type of brittle substance that of course later can break off and go through your oiling system. Um, this can cause damage to the bearing system in the turbo as well as even the bearing system in your car. So to prevent this, just don't shut it off. Um, what you're going to want to do is go on your spirited drive, pull up to your favorite restaurant, and let the car idle for a couple minutes. Just sitting there idling allows that oil to pass through the turbocharger and allows it to pull some of that heat away, helping to cool it down before you shut it off. It's kind of a simple thing to do and will really extend the life of your turbo. So one of the other topics in the do and don'ts is wastegates. So obviously uh, if you're running a turbo, you're going to run either an internal or external gate. And while the majority of our turbos run external gates, they're not always placed properly. You can check out one of our wastegate videos that goes over our wastegates and a little bit of that information in depth, but I will tell you that you want to make sure that the wastegate is placed so that the exhaust has a priority flow to the wastegate, meaning you don't want to put a wastegate on a pipe directly 90 degrees or even facing away from the exhaust flow because it's going to go past it into the turbo before it gets a chance to actually go out the gate. This of course is going to cause uh, some over boosting issues as you know if you're trying to target 10 psi you may end up targeting 14 or 15 psi depending on the setup. So it's one of those things you really want to be careful of. Make sure that your wastegates are placed properly um, and also of course sized properly. There's different sized gates for different applications and you can always call us here and ask us what size gate will work right for your particular turbo. One of the other big things, um, and it's probably one of the big biggest questions we get on a regular basis, is uh, the oil feed. So 90% um, of the time probably you don't want to use a restrictor. Obviously there are, there are those cases when a restrictor is going to need to be used it's on a case-by-case -case basis and we do not suggest throwing an oil restrictor in every turbo. Um, oil restrictors typically are only used on a ball bearing system when they are used or recommended. You will not want to use one on a journal bearing system. The journal bearings need the oil uh, much more than the ball bearing systems do and of course you can check out our video on ball bearing and journal bearings for a little more understanding of that. Oil feeds, of course, are just as important as oil drains. So the oil drain is probably one of the biggest things that causes um, a lot of issues and headaches for you know customers with smoking or oil leaking out of the turbo. So you do want to use a proper sized drain and a proper sized line to allow your turbo to properly drain back to the oil pan to prevent oil from backing up and of course causing smoking and leaking issues. We always recommend a dash 10 as a minimum size or 5 eighths of an inch uh, and of course if you've got room 
doesn't hurt to do a dash 12 or third, three quarter inch line either. One of the big things you want to make sure that you focus on is the drain flange itself. If you use our drain flange, it's guaranteed not to cover this opening. If you use another manufacturer's drain flange, it may be a little bit smaller and cover this opening causing a lip or a shelf here. That is going to cause oil to start to pull up, which can potentially cause oil to leak and your turbo to smoke. So if you're going to use an aftermarket flange, make sure that it's large enough to accommodate. The other thing is going to be is the flange itself usually has either a fitting built into it or a screw-in type fitting for a dash 10 or you know larger line. You want to make sure that the inside of that flange and that fitting is large enough. A lot of these will be 0 .380, you know, .400. They're too small um, and not adequate to actually get that flow out of there. Uh, we use a high-flowing Dash 10 ORB style fitting with our flange, and you can purchase those directly from Precision Turbo. One of the last things to talk about when it comes to the turbocharger and, of course, oil feed and oil drain and the do's and don'ts is crankcase ventilation. So we want to talk about that because the crankcase ventilation system is going to affect the drain system on the turbo. If you do not have a good crankcase ventilation, pressure is going to build up, which of course will try to escape out of the engine any means necessary. So it will try to go up the drain line into the turbo. Uh, when that happens and it's pushing pressure against it, the drain cannot work adequately and relieve the oil from the turbo and so it will start to come out the exhaust side of the turbo in most cases sometimes even on the compressor side if it's a severe situation so we want to make sure that the crankcase ventilation system is up to snuff we want to make sure that we have uh, valve covers and possibly even blocks you know vented properly we don't really want to use too much in the way of baffled catch cans as they can actually result in holding and retaining pressure. So it's, uh, it's good to make sure that you use a good breather system that's well adequate for the motor combination. And probably one of the last things to discuss um, in regards to the turbos is hard piping. So a lot of guys will run uh, you know, from a, a turbo directly to a throttle body, or from a turbo to an intercooler to a throttle body. And when they do this, they'll either weld a V-band flange onto the turbo, or maybe if it's a larger turbo like a Pro Mod that has an existing V-band flange here, they'll come off of that, and they'll weld a pipe from that hard all the way through the system. The problem with this is that we end up side-loading the turbo. So what that means is, if the turbo, for instance, is mounted to the chassis like it is in many race cars, or the turbo is braced off of something on the chassis, the motor and turbo will flex separately. That hard pipe that connects them will now actually put load against the turbo and actually start to flex this cover. When that happens, the wheel, of course, touches down, which causes damage to your compressor wheel and sometimes the turbo wheel as well. It's always best to make sure that either the turbo itself has a coupler on it or in the system somewhere you have a coupler so that you can get that flex and movement you need as the motor and, and turbo you know, move independently. The uh, only other way, of course, to do this is to make sure that the turbo itself is mounted directly to the motor and braced off of it so that the turbo and motor move as one unit. Um, if doing that, the exhaust side of the turbo cannot be braced whatsoever to the chassis because obviously that will add a point which will start to twist on the exhaust side causing side loading as well. So these are just some of the kind of major do's and don'ts with the turbocharger. Obviously there's a lot of things that you want to do, you want to make horsepower, you do want the turbo to live a long life, and you don't want to have to send it in here for service early because it didn't get adequately oiled or you possibly you know, side loaded a compressor or a turbine wheel. So if you follow some of these simple tips, they will help you with a long life for your turbocharger. 
and uh, you'll have a great time, whether it's on the street or at the track, making power and feeling boost. So that's it for this time on Turbo Talks. I'm Tristan Kimple. We'll see you next time. <laughs>